story of the first temple's pillars, which were named Joaquin and Boaz. We're going to be making its own video to help cross-referencing in the future. If you want to see how these two pillars fit into the larger story of the Bible, then watch the two pillars and the two witnesses. There's always a larger story in context with God. Let's understand the backstory here. God's chosen people, the Israelites, came into the Promised Land and eventually wanted a king to rule over them like the nations around them. God gave them Saul, who disobeyed God, and then he gave them David. King David was a good servant of God, and although he was flawed, he repented from his evil deeds, and a kingdom was established by God for David by seating his son Solomon on the throne. David wanted to build a house for God, but God didn't want David to build it since he had shed so much blood in his life. So he chose his son Solomon to build the first temple of God. If you want to see an amazing video about all the connections where God chose to build the first temple, watch Moriah, the Holy Land. It's 43 minutes long, but all those connections will leave you simply amazed. But back to Solomon and the first temple. He did build the house of God, but did something very particular when he placed two pillars in front of the temple. 1 Kings 7, 21. Then he set up the pillars by the vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the right and called its name Joaquin, and he set up the pillar on the left and called its name Boaz. God's first temple, built by Solomon, not only has two pillars at the entrance, but also goes a step further by naming the two pillars on either side. Boaz has a rather famous story in the book of Ruth of the man that redeems a foreign woman named Ruth and produces a child that becomes the grandfather to David, the king of Israel. Now, if you look for the name Joaquin in the Bible, you will come up with three different names, one of which did not live when this first temple was built, so we can disqualify him for this pillar. But the other two Joaquins in the Bible do give us insight into the pillar's meaning. In Hebrew, the names of the people have meaning as their names come from other root words. So if we look up the meaning of the names, we come up with this, Joaquin, he establishes, he will give certainty, Boaz, in strength, by strength. So by definition of the names themselves, the pillars together means he establishes in strength. This sounds like a very sturdy structure of two pillars to hold up the first temple of God that was built by Solomon, the son of the great king. That symbolism is there on purpose, both by me and God. Now how do the stories of Joaquin and Boaz each fit into this? First we'll start with Boaz's pillar. His story is a well-known story in the book of Ruth. Ruth 4, 9 through 10. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Malone's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malone, I have acquired as my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. Boaz redeems a woman by paying off a debt, then marrying a non-Israelite to make sure the family name will continue. And with a nice touch, Boaz asked the people to be his witnesses. Boaz's story to the pillar doesn't end there. Now look at Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 23-27. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. This is a well-known verse equating that the church is the bride of Christ. Let's compare the story of Boaz to Christ and the church. Boaz pays off a debt of land. Jesus pays the price for humanity to give us a chance to get to the ultimate promised land heaven. Boaz redeems a woman by marrying Ruth. Jesus redeems the people by marrying his bride, the church. Ruth is a non-Israelite. The Christian church is for all people, especially Gentiles, people that are non-Israelites. Boaz, who is named as a pillar, Ask the people to be a witness to the redemption. The pillars of the earth are actually witnesses. And here is something pertinent from the book of Timothy. 1 Timothy 3, 15. But if I should be delayed, you shall know how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. 
The church is the pillar and foundation of truth. If you break down the context of the stories, then you can see the connections and that there's something much larger going on here. Now we need to get to the Joaquin pillar. Remember, there were two Joaquins that lived before King Solomon's temple. The first one we'll bring up is from the book of Genesis. This Joaquin was a son of Simeon, one of the original Israelites that made their way down to Egypt. His father Simeon was someone significant too. Simeon and his brother Levi murdered the people at Shechem for raping his sister Dina. His father Jacob was not pleased with this and gave Simeon and Levi a very bad blessing. Look at the last part, Genesis 49, 5-7. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And when the Israelite tribes are given their lots of the promised land from Joshua, the Levites receive places scattered in other territories as they are priests, and the Simeonites receive a lot that is part of the land of Judah. So his father's bad blessing comes true for both of them. So in the overall context, this Joaquin, a Simeonite, comes down to a foreign land, and his descendants don't have a land of their own. The second Joaquin in the Bible would be a Levite and a grandson of Aaron, the first high priest. The whole family of Aaron were ordained as priests by God. We find this Joaquin mentioned in the book of Chronicles. In this chapter, they are dividing the succession order after Aaron, and here is where we find Joaquin. 1 Chronicles 24, 1-18 Now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. Then David, was a duke of the sons of Eleazar, and Halimelech of the sons of Ithamar, divided them according to the schedule of their service. Thus they were divided by Lot, the twenty-first to Joachim. The twenty-first Lot of Succession. Remember, everything has significance in the Bible, even numbers. That number twenty-one as a term of succession will find meaning in the New Testament. There isn't anything in the New Testament about a succession order, but there are two genealogies of Jesus Christ, one in Matthew and one in Luke. They are different, but both track the descendant line to Jesus. They start to differ after David. One follows the royal line of Solomon in Matthew, and the one in Luke through his brother Nathan. The first one we'll check out is in Matthew. This genealogy goes from Abraham to Jesus. But if we're comparing the succession order of Aaron to the descendants of Jesus Christ, then we have to find some commonality. Let's look at Aaron's genealogy, which we find in Exodus. Exodus 6, 23. Aaron took to himself Elisheba, daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nashon, his wife, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nashon, as his wife. Now, where do we find those names? Oh, right here in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. If Joaquin is a descendant of Aaron, then Aaron marrying the sister of Nashon would be a good place to start counting the descendant line from the first high priest. Now, if you count 21 generations from Nashon, you will come to someone significant, and his name is Zerubbabel. Now, that might sound arbitrary and forced, but let's hold on to this one and go to the other genealogy in Luke to see if we find anything there. Interesting thing, this Luke genealogy is listed in reverse order from Jesus all the way back to God. Everything has significance in the Bible, even how things are told. So if we go backward from Jesus, 21 generations we come to, whoa, Zerubbabel again. This cannot be a coincidence that both genealogies lead 21 generations to the same man from different ways. That number 21 from Joaquin is sounding meaningful right now. And now we have to look at the story of Zerubbabel. The Israelites went into exile as slaves to the king of Babylon for 70 years. Then God stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus to free his people out of captivity, and specifically to rebuild the second temple of God. And when the people come back to Jerusalem, there is that very specific person. Ezra 5.2 so Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Zerubbabel is not only in both descendant lines to Jesus, but becomes the man that rebuilds the house of God. Okay, that sounds like a really good connection to Jesus, but we're not done yet. Zerubbabel is mentioned in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah, which makes sense as they are all post-exile books. 
but a very eye-opening thing starts to happen in Haggai and the prophetic book of Zechariah. There's a lot to take in here, and this is going to read with all kinds of that double meaning we've been talking about. I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. We know Jesus Christ has been crowned king. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Jesus came in meekly and left the Holy Spirit. And Zerubbabel shall bring forth the capstone. We know from the Bible that Jesus Christ is the capstone. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hand shall also finish it. We know Jesus Christ built the temple of God. The plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. This plumb line is mentioned in Amos and in other parts of the Bible. It's a measuring line of righteousness, and the righteousness of Jesus Christ is how it is measured. In fact, in Revelation, this measuring line gets mentioned in chapter 11. Revelation 11, 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. And guess what? This is the chapter that was about the two witnesses who also turn out to be two pillars of God. So the story of Zerubbabel has a double meaning of Jesus Christ, and this is how the pillar of Joachim leads us through Zerubbabel to Jesus Christ. And now let's see the overview of both pillars and their stories again. Joachim I, a Simeonite who comes down to a foreign land and his descendants don't have a land of their own. Joachim II, a Levite priest, and like the Simeonites, the Levite descendants also don't have a land of their own. And this Joachim is the 21st lot of succession of Aaron the high priest, which connects numerically to the story of Zerubbabel, who not only builds the temple of God, but brings forth the capstone, holds the plumb line, and is a signet ring signifying kingship. Pillar 2. Boaz redeems a woman by paying off a debt of land and marrying a non-Israelite woman in front of witnesses. And now the story of Jesus overlaid. Comes down from heaven where earth belongs to the first king Satan and his followers don't have the inheritance of heaven yet. Jesus is the final high priest and promises to get us to our own promised land heaven. From Zerubbabel to Jesus Christ is 21 generations and Zerubbabel's story mirrors Jesus with Jesus building the temple, being the capstone, has the plumb line to measure righteousness, and has been crowned king. And Jesus Christ redeems mankind by paying the price for us to inherit heaven, then marries the church called the Bride of Christ through foreign people called Gentiles, and to top it off, the church is called a pillar in the book of Timothy. Wow! When you analyze the context of the stories, then you can see what God is doing here. I'd like to bring attention that the first pillar, Joachim, through Zerubbabel, symbolizes Jesus Christ a male, while the second pillar, through the marriage of Boaz and Ruth, symbolizes the church a female. That gendered symbolism is not an accident. Understanding the relationships and how the pillars fit into the overall story of the whole Bible will help you see the end and Jesus' marriage to the church balancing out the pairing in the beginning of the first flawed marriage of Adam and Eve. We will continue to drive this point as we move along with these videos and this becomes more clear. But for now, you can see the deeper meaning through the connections and the context of the stories and why the pillars of the first temple were called Joaquin and Boaz. Please like, share, and subscribe and turn on those notifications so I can continue to connect the Word of God. God bless. Mm -hmm.